Mighty Number no. 9. Man, I'm excited to do this review. This is such a controversial game right now. It raised millions of dollars on Kickstarter, was advertised as Mega Man's spiritual successor, and the project was even headed by Inafune, the man behind Mega Man's success to begin with. Well, it launched this week to a ton of negative reviews, and it's getting trashed on the internet left and right. Now it's my turn to review it, and I have to say, I mostly disagree with a lot of the negative reviews out there. It's far from a perfect game, but I liked it. I liked it a lot. And there's going to be a lot of comparisons I'm going to make between Mighty Number no. 9 and the Mega Man franchise because without the Mega Man franchise, this game wouldn't even exist, so you have to compare. So we'll take a look at it together, and I'll show you why I liked it. Let's go back a couple of years. I experienced my childhood, the golden years, if you will. Through the late 80s and early 90s, a time when Ninja Turtles toys flooded Walmarts everywhere. The Ghostbusters kept Slimer as a pet. Kool-Aid came in a million creative flavors, and arcades were sucking away the quarters of parents everywhere. Video games were everywhere, and Nintendo had just saved the entire industry from crashing and burning. My first console was technically an Atari 2600 that I inherited from my sisters who were a couple years older than I was, but the original NES was the first video game console that I truly loved. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Now you're playing with power. From the beginning, I was an instant and permanent fan of games like Zelda, Super Mario Bros., Metroid, Contra, Castlevania, but another game also joined the ranks of these classics, Mega Man. The little blue robot that spawned a million sequels, spin-offs, and even a cartoon series. Anyone remember that one? Now let's fast forward to today. Mega Man, for the most part, has disappeared, only popping up in small roles here and there. Us old school gamers that grew up with him are now adults, and the younger gamers of today were raised with games like Halo and Call of Duty. Would today's kids even be interested in a game like Mega Man? The time for Mega Man to return is past due, and it doesn't look like it's happening anytime soon. This is where Mighty Number no. 9 comes in. After an insanely successful Kickstarter campaign, Mighty Number no. 9, Beck, was introduced to the world, and he was hailed as Mega Man's spiritual successor. But does this game capture the charm and feel of the Mega Man franchise of old? The plot is ripped right out of a Mega Man game pretty much. It doesn't go very deep at all. Mighty Number no. 9 is from a world at peace. A world where violence is confined to a coliseum where robots fight each other for sport. And robots are infected with a virus and start going crazy and attacking outside of the coliseum. And it's up to Mighty Number no. 9 to stop the robot uprising. And Mighty Number no. 9 starts off much like Mega Man X, where you have an intro stage and what looks like a futuristic highway. Way. Some scenes look extremely similar, especially the parts where the floor falls under your feet. If you've played the Mega Man X games, you'll be immediately familiar with the controls and what you can do. Mighty Number no. 9 can jump, shoot, and even dash like X, so the gameplay is the same, except with a little twist. When you shoot enemies enough, they get stunned. At this point, you have the option of continuing to shoot them until they explode, or dash into them to absorb their powers, which can make you faster, stronger, etc. And that's how you beat bosses too. You shoot them until they're stunned, then dash into them to keep them from getting their health back. It makes the boss battles a little bit more challenging, and I think it's a welcome addition to the gameplay. I do wish they had brought over Mega Man's ability to charge his Mega Buster. And X's ability to bounce off of walls too though. After you beat this first level, you're granted with a familiar screen. In classic Mega Man games, you typically have 8 stages to choose from with a boss at the end of each stage. After you beat a boss, you gain their powers. And there's always a recommended order to face the bosses too since each boss is weak against other bosses' abilities. For example, in Mega Man X, if you fight Flame Mammoth, you gain his Fire Wave ability, which you can then use to take down Chill Penguin in seconds. Mighty Number no. 9 has the same setup. You have all your stages and bosses, and you choose what you want to do in whatever order you want to. 
Now let's take a look at the bosses you face and the powers they give you. The first stage you probably want to do is the oil platform, which is your typical fire stage, and once you make your way through it, you fight Mighty Number no. 1, Pyrogen. He's your typical fire boss too, and the one I chose to face first. And just like Mega Man bosses, the key to winning is to learning each boss's patterns and avoiding their attacks. About halfway through the battles, they usually add something new to the mix to keep you on your toes. Pyrogen, for example, charges at you and you can jump over him or slide under him if he jumps up. Sometimes he implodes and you have to avoid the blast. However, halfway through the fight, he has a grab attack that instantly kills you. So now you have to adjust how you fight him midway through the fight. It's all about quick thinking and quick reflexes. I'm not going to go over the strategy on how to beat every single boss since this video is a review, not a strategy guide. But this gives you an overall idea of how these boss battles go down. After beating him, he gives you his ability, which lets you create a fire explosion. And I have heard some complaints that many of the powers in the game are kind of useless, which I kind of felt that this one was pretty useless overall. But does anybody remember Top Man and Mega Man 3? That was one of the most useless powers in the entire Mega Man franchise, so this is nothing new. Every Mega Man game has that one power. What I think is really cool about the powers you get in this game is the fact that they actually change Mighty No. 9's appearance. In Mega Man games, Mega Man typically just changes colors when he gets enemy abilities until later games when you can upgrade different suits. So this is pretty cool. I always like it when a character has physically different forms in the game. After beating Pyrogen, I went to the Waterworks Bureau, and this is your typical ice level with some slippery floors. Be your fight mighty number two, Cryosphere, who's a female robot that sounds like a little girl who continuously makes puns and jokes. This fight was a little annoying because she uses one of my video game pet peeves, bosses that freeze you. You want to whip out your newly attained fire powers and take her out that way. After beating Cryosphere, you get an ice blast and you should head over to the military base. After making your way through explosive barrels and conveyor belts, you fight Mighty Number no. 5, Battalion. And I really like his character design. He looks like a combination of different weapons, and he can even bend down and turn into a cannon. Ready? Once you use your ice powers, he keeps slowing down and his health goes away pretty quickly. He gives you the ability to shoot explosive missiles, and off you go to the mine. This stage is mostly underground, and instantly it reminded me of Armored Armadillo stages from Mega Man X and Drill Man's Mega Man 4 stage too. It's got a couple of electric spikes that can kill you in one hit that you have to be careful with, and giant drills you have to run away from. And here you face Mighty Number no. 4, Seismic. He's definitely one of the easier bosses, he just keeps trying to run into you from left to right. As long as you use your new missile powers, he's really not much of a threat. You might even be able to take this guy out first before getting any of the other powers. And once you beat him, he gives you his ramming ability that lets you run into enemies. The next stage you want to do is the highway, which looks really cool. You just make your way through traffic, jumping from car to car until you make it to Mighty Number no. 7, Brandish. Clearly inspired by Zero from Mega Man X. And I like that the bosses have some sort of personality. Every time you fight one, they have a little conversation with Mighty Number no. 9, and this reminds me of the later Mega Man X games, which did the same thing. I'm here to help! I've come to save you, Brand! I can't... I can't control myself! This was easily one of my favorite boss battles, and one of the most difficult ones too. He's fast, and he's got two swords he uses to teleport around the screen and hit you, so you want to avoid his slashes as best as possible. Activate the power Seismic gave you, and hit him from behind repeatedly. And once you beat him, he gives you the ability to have swords, and you can slash your way through enemies. I use this power more than any other after getting it. It's kinda weak, but it's fast, and you can cut enemies down in no time using it. The next stage of the power plant has you going through a base where the lights go on and off, clearly inspired by Spark Mandrel's Mega Man X stage. And this part here was a bit annoying too, because those purple turbines kill you in one hit if you touch them, and you have to slide just right in between two of them to avoid getting killed. And of course, you've got an electric theme boss here, Mighty Number no. 3, Dynatron, who floats around the screen and shoots little electric mines at you. She's pretty easy to beat with your sword attack since that's her weakness. There's really not much else to be said about her. She gives you an electric attack where you can stick mines on people and you keep electrocuting them. Uh, definitely one of the weaker powers that you get overall. 
Next, you head to the Capitol building, and this level was a bit different than the others. Instead of getting from point A to point B, you have to follow where the sniper fire is coming from, and keep hitting the enemy that's doing it until he decides to fight you. So you're kind of running around a lot in this level, in different directions. And the enemy firing at you is Mighty Number 8, Countershade. Now, as far as character design goes, I absolutely loved him. He's got this desperado assassin look to him, and his voice actor was perfectly cast, Steve Blum. The second I heard his voice, I instantly knew where else I've heard him. Emancipation is worth any price, even if it costs human lives. The city boy is out of his element. Savage Land ain't so bad once you get used to it. That's right, this guy plays Wolverine all the time. Couldn't have casted this character any better. His fight's pretty easy though. He just hides behind objects and shoots at you in specific patterns. His weakness technically is the electric attack that Dynatron gave you. But honestly, I just preferred to keep slashing him over and over with the sword, since he does stay still for quite a bit. After you beat him, you get a rifle, just like he has, that lets you shoot bullets that bounce off of objects. So off you head to the radio tower. You basically just keep climbing up until you make it to the top, and sometimes the wind changes patterns too, so you do have to time your jumps and adjust them accordingly. And once you get to the top, you fight Might in number 6, Aviator. He flies around parts of the screen and dives at you or shoots missiles at you. Once you use Cross Shade's ability, you can bounce bullets back at him in the air and his health goes down pretty fast. And after beating him, he gives you the ability to glide. And you can also shoot a spinning helicopter blade, which you can use to fight Pyrogen if you didn't fight him first like I did. One thing I thought was a bit different from Mega Man was how Mighty Number no. 9 handles the bosses. Mega Man mercilessly blows up his old friends once they become bad. Once you dash into them, Mighty Number no. 9 heals them of the robot virus they're suffering from, and they usually thank him for saving them. I owe you one, don't I, Beck? Then in future levels, those same robots you once fought are helping Mighty Number no. 9 by doing different things in the background. I thought this was cool because it does make them feel like more than just bosses that you have to beat. Now how do you know? What order should I fight these bosses in? In Mega Man games, sometimes it was pretty obvious. You see an ice themed boss, you use the fire powers to fight him. But other times it was a guessing game. Mighty Number no. 9 helps you out tremendously here, which... I have mixed feelings on. It kind of felt like it was holding your hand. Part of the fun of the Mega Man games was fighting different bosses and figuring out on your own. Which ability do I use to fight this boss? And it was fun experimenting with all the different powers, trying to figure that out. After you beat a boss, you'll see an option appear under other stages that says Advice. Once you click it, one of the bosses you previously beat speak to you and say they'll help you there. That's how you know which powers to use. You can, of course, ignore the button and not click it if you want the challenge of figuring it out on your own. But the previous boss does show up in the stage to help you either way, so you'll know what to do regardless. Now, I did say the game, like most games out there, isn't perfect. And the stage after you beat all the bosses is a perfect example of why. After zipping around as Mighty Number no. 9, getting a bunch of cool powers, you get stuck playing as Call for one level, this game's version of Roll. Her level's boring, she's slow, can only do one attack, and I just wanted it to be over. You have to walk around looking for key cards to open up locked doors, and then you fight a boss, which looks like a robot dog. I think this level just should have been scrapped overall. It adds nothing to the game. If anything, it takes away all the fun that you previously were having, and it slows down the momentum of the game. As a whole, the level design of Mighty Number no. 9 is a bit more basic, and it's a little more watered down than the Mega Man games. Overall, the levels are fun to play through, but could have used a little more fine-tuning. Where's all the secret capsules that upgrade your armor? Where's the hidden hearts that upgrade your health bar? Where's the E-Tanks that give you backup health on reserve? I understand that this isn't Mega Man, but the game is advertised as a spiritual successor to Mega Man. So why were some of the things that made Mega Man a deeper experience not here? And the graphics in the game have been severely attacked online, which I can also understand. The first pieces of the game shown on Kickstarter were just concept art. The final game was never going to look like that, but I think it would have been a much better option if the game had an art style closer to that original concept. 
concept art. It's clear that what we ended up with was purely a design choice, something that was purposely made to look like an anime with simplified graphics. It doesn't look awful, but does look like something that could have been a late PS2 game or early PS3 game, especially by today's standards and graphics. And the voice acting for most of the game is pretty bad by today's standards too, but no better than any Mega Man game I've ever played. There's no reason for me to go on. What? What am I fighting for? Bad voice acting was pretty standard for video games of the past. Look at the original Resident Evil. Stop it! Don't open that door! Here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. You were almost a Jill sandwich. Now all of these things combined give off a feel that Mighty Number no. 9 was designed for the PS1 era, which I can appreciate, but at the same time understand why it may not sit well with modern audiences. And Mega Man is also known for its awesome soundtrack. That's another thing Mighty Number no. 9 missed out on. I can still play in my head Metal Man's theme over and over. <laughs> or even Storm Eagles. Outside of the main theme, Mighty No. 9 has no memorable music. It all sounds pretty generic, and that is a bit disappointing. One cool thing, though, is that you can change the soundtrack to a retro-style soundtrack, too. I didn't really use this feature the first time around, but if I do a second playthrough, I'll probably play with the retro soundtrack. And I won't spoil who or what the final boss is story-wise, but it doesn't have that powerful presence that Dr. Wily had once he appeared on the screen. Or even Sigma. Once you defeated him and he transformed into a more powerful form, it evokes this feeling in you where you're just like, oh my god. This final boss doesn't evoke that same feeling. And tell me that doesn't look like Ghastly from Pokemon. As you fight the boss and its health goes down, it does have multiple forms and it's a pretty hard fight. But once you do learn the patterns and which powers it's weak against, you can take it down without much effort. Total game time took me about five and a half hours on normal mode, which is pretty basic for a game of this style. Now where does this game leave the future of old school revivals? Putting aside the fact that I seriously enjoyed the gameplay, and I'm pretty happy with the game overall, there's no doubt that the launch of the game was a complete disaster. First, it's launching to overwhelmingly negative reviews. The marketing campaign was one of the worst I have ever seen. And a lot of people that backed it on Kickstarter didn't get codes, got the wrong ones, or got codes that didn't even work. There's really no excuse for that, and no matter how good the game would have been, this would have guaranteed a huge backlash regardless. Are future Kickstarter projects doomed also? We've got Ukulele coming up, which looks outstanding, and it's the spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie. And if Mega Man is my second favorite gaming franchise, Castlevania is my number one favorite of all time. And the man behind Castlevania is also bringing back that style of gaming with Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, another ridiculously successful Kickstarter project, and the spiritual successor to Castlevania. Both of these projects have as much hype behind them as Mighty No. 9 did, and they look equally as good as what was shown to us during the Kickstarter campaign. Can they survive the intense scrutiny of today's audiences and bring back old school gaming? Hopefully these are received a bit better. It's scary to think that we may be seeing the end of old school gaming right now. Maybe now's the perfect time to bring back the real Mega Man. We may need him now more than ever. Because after all the negativity behind Mighty Number no. 9, I, I don't see how we're gonna get another one. But if you haven't played it yet and you enjoy the Mega Man games, check it out. It'd be different if it was a $60 game but it's only $20 on the PlayStation Store, for example, and it's a lot of fun to play while it lasts. So give it a chance and form your own opinion. You may end up liking it a lot more than you expect. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed my in-depth look into Mighty No. 9. Remember to like and subscribe and leave me a comment down below telling me how you felt about the game if you played it, or if you're choosing not to play it, why not? And make sure to check out my other videos that I bring you two to three times a week. This is Fabian from GamerThumb TV. Till next time, guys.